Art is someone who really doesn't need an introduction, or at least that's what he told me when I talked to him yesterday about what I should say up here. He said, you know what, since I'm a professor at the HPL, everyone already knows me. I don't want a big, long introduction. So I said, well, that's true, Art, but you know, we do have a lot of students. We often get new faces. So we compromised, and I said I would do a really fast sort of lightning round version of the typical introduction I would do. So with that in mind, as I said, Art is a professor here at the HPL. His educational background was in electrical engineering and then mechanical engineering. He did his postdoc in neurological sciences studying balance. And his group here does, um, he brings sort of that variety to his research. Specifically, his group uh, very broadly uses engineering principles to bridge the gap between mechanics and biology. So what that really means is specifically their group looks at stuff like prosthetic limb design, neural control of muscles, and sensory motor integration for balance, movement energetics, that kind of thing. So um, with all of that, I think I've even said more than I promised Art I would say. So I'm going to put this mic down, and as soon as they're all set up, they'll start the presentation. Uh, sorry, we have to, we're just transferring the file because it turns out well, we can't just use HDMI, to, which is what my computer wants to do. Okay, so just to let you know what, what we're talking about. Ooh. What we hope to talk about is uh, the title is the arm bone connects to the leg bone, except in neural control of movement. And this is uh, some slides. Part, part of this talk is some slides that I pulled from a meeting that we hosted last year called at the Banff International Research Station. And it was about uh, getting a bunch of uh, people who study human behavior using optimization. Uh, but studying different kinds of behavior uh, together to talk about what we do. And we had people who, who do uh, neural control of reaching. We had some locomotion people. We had some people who study uh, foraging behaviors, uh, all sorts of different things. And OK, so this is the title. And so the. Um, the background is basically people who study movement using uh, optimization. And most of what I'm going to talk about is basically a complaint about, uh, about the way things are going in current <coughs> approaches using optimization. OK, so there's a, there's a song called the Skeleton Dance that some of you might have learned um, in, uh, as a child. And, um, it has something to do with the arm bone connecting to the leg bone, or you know, leg bone connects to the hip bone, etc. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Yes. Okay. So people have heard of it. Okay. So it's kind of obvious that uh, that you know you have one body, you have one nervous system, and these things should be related to each other. However, in locomotion there's a leg bone, and in reaching, there's an arm bone. And these two, at present, in the research world, have almost nothing to do with each other. OK, so that's basically my complaint. What do we mean when we say we're using optimization principles? The idea is that you have many decision variables. It could be your muscle forces over time. It could be uh, just a decision that you're making. Am I going to uh, buy this? Uh, neat piece of sports equipment or not. Um, it could be, am I going to reach and how quickly am I going to reach? Some sort of movement decision variable. And in order to resolve the question among many variables, what we do is we formulate some objective function as a function of those variables. And then the minimum of that objective determines our decision, our ultimate uh, choice of those variables. way to approach things. And uh, 
I think the reason why people are using optimization is not necessarily because they believe uh, this is the way the nervous system works so much as they don't have any other ideas. So uh, up until the time that optimization became popular, you could say that a lot of what people were doing is basically description, but they weren't really good at, uh, at uh, prescribing or predicting uh, behaviors that they hadn't observed. And so uh, you could say that this approach basically is what they do. You know, you, you've probably heard of um, how uh, DeepMind uh, has a reinforcement learning program that plays chess better than any human. And actually, nowadays it's chess, it's uh, Go, it's uh, video games, complex multiplayer video games. That's also an optimization approach. Okay, and now in locomotion, you could say that the, the state of where things are is uh, people are interested in co energetic cost of transport, and they are using, they're predicting decision variables such as walking speed. This is the only thing, but this is a popular thing. Uh, and then in reaching, the idea is that uh, you're predicting something about the hand trajectory in uh, an upper extremity reaching movement, and that, and uh, the objective function is something about the, var the variance or the error in the uh, movement. And uh, as I said, I'm complaining about a lack of commonality between these two. They really have nothing to do with each other, even though ultimately we think there's one nervous system making uh, these decisions. Uh, what are the excuses for why they're different? Well, walking mostly is done by the spinal cord. It's more hardwired. Uh, also, the legs are heavy, so you, uh, it makes sense to care about energy. And, um, and also walking is kinetic, so you care about forces. And then the excuses why, um, why reaching would be mostly concerned with, say, errors in reaching is that, first of all, it's a whole different system. It's the motor cortex, not the spinal cord. Um, there's much more flexibility. The arms are l much lighter, so who cares about energy? Um, and ultimately, when you're trying to reach for something, you could say that your goal is a kinematic goal. Okay, so these are some of the reasons why people uh, study the things that they do and in the way they do. Okay, uh, some complaints we might have are, first of all, there's too much task specificity compared to real life. Like in real life, there's much more going on than deciding on the walking speed. In fact, I have to decide whether I'm going for a walk at all. I have to decide where I'm going. Um, in reaching, uh, we, we have to make those same decisions. How fast and what are we going to do? Um, I don't like incompatible objectives. We would like to see something where you can draw a um, relationship between these two things. And then also I would just say poor ecological relevance in the sense that uh, these are very far from the kinds of things that, that humans are really contending with day to day. Okay, what are we going to talk about today? Uh, I'll talk a little bit about locomotion just to give you a little bit of a background on what we've done. And, um, and I'm going to propose that there are two costs that we currently think are important um, that contribute to the total energetic cost of walking. And then uh, also tell you what's wrong with those costs. And um, in particular, you could say the, the uh, topic of the day in locomotion, when people, if people agree that energy matters, they tend to favor energetic cost of transport, um, which I don't like as a, an idea. So I'm going to complain about that. Um, and then we'll talk about kinematics of the upper extremity. And I'll uh, complain about why I don't like thinking of reaching in a kinematic way and why I think energy is, in fact, relevant. And then if we agree that um, there's something wrong with costs and there's something wrong with, uh, sorry, energetic costs and something wrong with kinematics, then maybe that we can find some, some common ground between the two. Okay. By the way, I have no idea how long this talk is going to go because I sort of grabbed a bunch of slides and threw them together. So we will dynamically figure out uh, what's, what we'll actually cover in these things. Okay. 
Here's some classic uh, uh, results from walking. What I'm plotting is metabolic power. That, that's the rate of uh, basically chemical or food energy you're using per time. Um, and the uh, stride frequency of walking. And the observation is that for a given speed, the cost does something like this. By the way, I, I'm just realizing from the shadow of my head on the board that I have horrible helmet hair, so I apologize for that. Um, here's the, uh, the observation is that uh, you can measure the energetic cost and you can measure what stride frequency people prefer to walk at. And interestingly, they seem to prefer something close to the minimum of the energetic cost. And in fact, you can do that at a whole bunch of different speeds. And in fact, uh, quite consistently, people are choosing a different stride frequency that still coincides quite closely with the minimum of energetic cost. Uh, just as a shout out, uh, uh, John Bertram did a study a few years ago that showed that uh, you don't have to think of it in terms of only um, sort of a set stride frequency, but uh, in fact, he looked at, think of this as a whole energetic cost surface as a function of walking, uh, of say step length and uh, step frequency. Okay, um, let's just focus on one of these things. Um, some other work that's been done, uh, Max Donlin showed that, uh, that the step width that people choose also coincides with the minimum. Um, Jessica Selinger showed that it's not just a coincidence, but it seems to be indeed a preference by um, altering the um, energetic costs. She found that people have a tendency to uh, prefer the lower energetic cost under altered conditions. Um, our own interest of, for uh, today is that we've proposed two contributions that help make this apparent bowl shape. Uh, one of them is that we've proposed that there's a cost for taking long steps that has to do with collisions. Basically, the longer the step you take, uh, the worse the collision of your foot with the ground. That collision dissipates mechanical energy. You have to do positive mechanical work in order to make up for those losses. Uh, and so we've uh, spent some, quite some time proposing that there's a cost for that. But that cost only goes up for longer steps or slower uh, step frequencies. And so this does not agree with the ball shape that's been observed empirically. So there's clearly something wrong there. And so uh, we proposed another cost um, that goes in the opposite direction. There's another cost for walking at high step frequencies it has nothing to do with collisions, and we we propose that it actually has to do with um, uh, with uh, the cost of activating muscle. And in fact, it's not even related to the work that muscle does, but we believe it has to do with uh, pumping of calcium uh, in, in order to activate muscle. Okay, uh, just as a shout out, uh, Osman, who's here, uh, is using. Uh, costs such as this to predict how people should walk over uneven terrain. Uh, Ryan Schroeder just recently defended his thesis, and he's talked about how to entrain walking to periodic disturbances. Uh, Delisle Pollitt uh, is defending tomorrow, I believe, and uh, he is using optimization and costs such as this to uh, predict how and what gates you should use if you're a biped or a quadruped going at different speeds. Okay, let's uh, focus back on these two costs. And just, I, I just wanna give an example of how to use, how we use the optimization approach to um, sort of make predictions and, and test them. Okay, so um, I said that Jess Selinger said that it seems to be more a preference than just a coincidence that people prefer the um, minimum of energetic cost. Um, I won't describe too much about what she did, except that uh, in her study, she altered the dynamics of walking and um, people were able to, um, to reduce their energetic cost and they were able to, to um, keep at that 
uh, at a given step frequency. But um, there were some issues. So people didn't necessarily discover their preferred frequency until they were shown that frequency or demonstrated that frequency. And uh, that has to do with some of the apparatus that they uh, use in the experiment. Um, I'm not going to describe uh, much more except to say that we wanted to do uh, something a little bit closer to um, uh, li a little bit more immediate and to test whether uh, under circumstances close to normal walking, whether people will more readily find their um, optimum and, uh, and select it. Okay, so here's how we did that. Um, Uh, we did a study a long time ago where we put these arc-shaped uh, things under the feet. So this is a, a boot that you wear that freezes your ankle, and then you're just walking on these arcs. And uh, we showed that basically, based on this collision cost, you can predict uh, how much uh, collision loss there will be. And if you vary the size of the arcs, you will change the amount of collision costs, and then you will be able to change the energetic cost of walking. and uh, uh, to some degree, the, uh, the frequency at which people uh, want to step, okay? Uh, here's a prediction that, uh, that comes out of that. If you make people walk on smaller arcs, what you're doing is you're taking this collision cost, and you are, first of all, making things worse, so everything costs more. Uh, but also there's a, you know, there's a slight shift in the curve. Uh, I should also mention that uh, we weight matched these arcs and these arcs so that they weigh the same amount and we believe they don't have too much effect on uh, the cost of walking at different step frequencies. They mostly have an effect on the collisions. Okay, so if you were to believe that there is this hypothetical uh, cost to swing the legs or moving the legs quickly. And if we said that the sum of these two costs determines the normal preferred frequency, then if you change that with this new curve, then you have to sum up this new curve with the, um, the step frequency cost. And what you'll get is something different. Uh, you will get a new bowl shape with a new minimum, and so a higher cost overall, but a different step frequency. So that's the prediction that we can make. And then, uh, so, and we can do the experiment, right? Okay, so uh, our student Justin Sung did the experiment. But basically, the question was, you can put two, say two extreme versions of these arcs on people, and you predict um, higher optimal step frequency on the smaller arcs, and then we can see whether people will just choose that automatically without them, without us telling them anything about what's happening. They just know they're walking on these two different things. We let them walk in the way they want. Okay, so here are the results. This is the preferred step frequency uh, in Hertz versus the arc size. And um, we tested a, a series of arc sizes and the blue curve is actually the, um, I, uh, this is, the blue curve is a fit to the data, but the form of the fit actually comes from our proposed uh, costs. So in other words, this isn't a pure curve fit, it's partially a model, and it's just saying that our model does a reasonably good job of predicting how step frequency should change as a function of arc shape. Uh, just for reference, Normal human walking, like in your regular shoes, if you're a regular sized person, is roughly around 1.8 hertz. So we're not drastically changing frequency away from what you normally do, but we can do it in a um, sort of predictable, gradual uh, way. Okay, so then the question is, um, do you need extensive learning, or do you need to be demonstrated this, um, what, what step frequency you can choose, or will you choose it yourself? And uh, our argument is that people should be able to choose it themselves because this is not a drastic variation from normal walking. If you've ever walked in um, ski boots, for example, you've walked in some weird shoes and uh, you sort of figured out what to do. And um, 
the question is, did, did you do that optimally? Okay, so what I'm showing you is um, uh, we start people walking at time zero, but we have a, a metronome. So we are forcing them to walk at a given frequency, either the red one or the purple one. And then after about 30 seconds, we uh, turn off the metronome and we say, okay, go for it, do whatever you want. And uh, the question is, once you remove that constraint, where are people gonna go and over how much time? And then what you see here is about three minutes of data. And what you see is that uh, if we started them on the low side, they immediately jumped up to a higher frequency and then you can see them settling down to towards some sort of a preference. And then if you, we started them on the high side, they immediately jumped down and then you can see them also oozing towards a preference. Um, you could argue that uh, after three minutes we're not done, but I'm going to still claim that I think that these things are heading towards a, an agreement, okay? on the order of a few minutes. Art? Yeah. Do you have an idea why there's that hysteresis in the beginning? Uh, well, if, these two things did happen at different times. So they had to do one condition first, and then you could say that um, after you've experienced that, you're a different person. Um, and uh, I, I think you basically you're a different person all the time. Uh, what do I mean by that? Well, today you wore the shoes of today, and maybe yesterday you wore different shoes, and um, you started off walking a certain way in the morning, and then in the afternoon, uh, maybe you're a little bit tired, or you maybe you had some coffee, or maybe you had a big scoop of ice cream. All of these things change your physio physiological state, and um, it's quite possible that, you know, these things could alter all sorts of patterns of your uh, behavior. Um, there's a great study that came out just a couple of years ago um, where, um, what's the title of the paper? Okay, I'm blanking on the title of the paper, but here's, I'll, I, all I remember is the idea of the paper. They studied reaching speeds in people and they found that people reach faster if they just had breakfast, okay? so. Uh, the, the short answer to your question is I, I don't know, but the long answer, well, actually, I guess it's also a short answer for me to say, I think it's quite believable that uh, your physiological state is fluctuating all the time, maybe not by huge amounts, but that will influence your behavior. Okay, so we only did the uh, metabolic cost experiment for the two extremes of the arcs, and that's because it's actually quite time consuming to, to measure metabolic cost. This is with um, oxygen consumption, and you need some time to reach steady state. But basically, what you're seeing here is the metabolic cost versus um, uh, step frequency. And this is for people wearing the big arcs and wearing the small arcs. And there are two arrows shown, one is the preferred frequency on the big arcs, and then just for reference, they're wearing the big arcs. Uh, but just for reference, when they're wearing the small arcs, the preferred frequency is higher. And then um, similarly, when they're wearing little arcs, you can see that the big arc is uh, lower step frequency. Okay, so let's look at the data. Uh, the, the data is noisy. Uh, that's just because energetic cost measurements are noisy. Uh, but essentially, here's the dots are the data, and then what you're seeing is um, our fit to that data, and then we take the minimum of the fit, and that's what we would call the optimum on the big arcs. And the idea is that, well, what, what are we looking for? We want to see whether the optimum coincides with the preference. It's a little bit in the eye of the beholder whether you say these coincide or not. In fact. Everything I showed you before where, you know, people say the preferred step frequency agrees with minimum of energetic cost. Well, it doesn't agree exactly because, you know, you take any curve, the chances of the minimum of that curve coinciding exactly with whatever point is basically zero. 
So the, really what we're saying is this is pretty close to this. And not only that, people shifted their step frequency away from the big arc. So everything is in the direction that we say, you may argue whether this is exactly a minimum or not. And then the answer is, um, I think it's pretty close. And then similarly on the uh, small arcs, people shifted to a higher step frequency. <clears throat> the curve has an optimum and then that optimum is not far from the uh, preference, okay? And what we're talking about again is essentially we are starting people off and then we start recording the data. We wait three minutes for people to reach steady state and then we record data over the next three minutes for an average. And you could also argue that maybe it takes tens of minutes or hundreds of minutes to really get to your true preference, perhaps. Okay. Um, why, don't, why don't I just ask, are there any questions about this? Because we'll, we'll skip to some other stuff. How uncomfortable are these shoes? Uh, how uncomfortable are they? They're not terribly uncomfortable. The uh, small arcs are kind of annoying to walk on, but I think annoyance is the only thing you would uh, complain about. These uh, bigger ones actually feel kind of fun. It's like, oh, whoo, um, that's kind of neat. Uh, we also went to huge arcs, much bigger than this, um, uh, because what we were interested in is what happens when you um, get to arcs where the radius of curvature is equal to leg length. So then you're just sort of, you know, in principle, you would just be sort of gliding along. Um, that was fun for a little bit, but it wasn't fun for long. And uh, that's because, or we believe, uh, the problem is that when you're on these huge arcs, um, that one way or the other, if you want your leg to be straight, you need to produce a, a moment about your knee. And so you could imagine that if I'm standing on these huge arcs on the toes of those arcs, and I don't want to hyperextend my knee, I need to uh, contract my hamstrings pretty hard to, um, to avoid the hyperextension. Um, and we did notice that, you know, we had fun during the experiment, but the next day, uh, I, I remember my hamstrings were really sore, uh, which I wasn't really anticipating uh, during the experiment. So it, just going back to my question, I guess what I was wondering is um, that I was sort of imagining the, the, the small arc being less comfortable, as you say. Uh, and then does that make you more sensitive to the discomfort as a function of collisions? And then is that maybe the reason you see people adapt a higher stride frequency where collisions are maybe less annoying with that foot? And then is that just sort of happen to be somewhat coincident with moving toward a minimum cost? Um, so is that a confounder or do you care or? I guess I don't have too much opinion about it. So, um, yes, yeah, so people did something over a time course of uh, a couple minutes. Um, there's some dynamics to their, um, to their adaptation. I don't really know what contributes to that. Um, you can speculate on many, many possible things. So. I, I don't want to have an opinion about it. But what, what you say, I think, is totally plausible. Uh, the reducing step frequency, can it be due to the ground clearance? Because it's more difficult when wearing big arcs. So that's the only way of clearing the ground with a slower swing leg. So they are having, they are reducing step frequency. Um, that is a possible contribution. But I will say that in our prediction, which was based on collisions, we were not concerned with, um, with hitting the ground with the foot. Um, I'm not saying that what you're saying is wrong. I'm just saying we didn't consider that in our prediction. So collisions alone are enough to predict that you would change your step frequency, right? Did you need to control for the weight difference between the big arcs and the small arcs at all, or was it pretty similar? Well, when I say weight match, what I mean is that all of these had a little, uh, some lead weights attached to them. Uh, well, these didn't, the biggest ones didn't, but basically we um, attached lead weights to these so that overall the weight was in, was in, I think, 10 grams of each other. One thing you can't control for is there's also a rotational moment of inertia. And of course, these are gonna have a slightly higher rotational moment than these. However, if you sort of do, you know, the parallel axis theorem and you compute what the total effect would be, 
the ML square term of parallel axis theorem is is quite a bit bigger than the you know I term of parallel axis theorem. So so we don't think so even though we couldn't control for that perfectly, we don't think it was a big effect. Uh, I was just wondering about uh, how much the how much energy loss is due to this impact. Like in running, it's the collision is quite elastic, but uh, what about the walking? Okay, in walking, uh, a typical walking, uh, an observation that we've made um, is about on the order of 20 joules of mechanical work dissipated upon the collision of, with, of the foot with the ground. Now, you could also argue that part of walking is elastic, and um, we don't truly know how much of that 20 joules is returned elastically or not. Uh, and it's very hard to determine that. But I will say that um, I believe there is quite a substantial amount of that that you don't get back um, elastically. And then for running, um, I would say the same thing occurs. So in running, there's also a, a collision, and you lose more than 20 joules per, per strike. And then uh, running is thought to be elastic, but for humans, at least, we don't have a really good estimate of how, how much is returned. If you were to do the same experiment for running, uh, We have not. It's, um, so even I said it's kind of fun to do this for walking. Uh, I would not run in these. Yeah, it's <laughs> also these are made of wood, so I think they would not hold up well to uh, running. I, th I think for running, um, the experiment that we wanted to do and we wasted a lot of time trying to do is, if you remember, there was uh, a time when there it was kind of popular. There were these. Um, these attachments you could get for the feet called power skips, and they were made of fiberglass or carbon fiber, and they were basically really springy things. And um, and back in the day, uh, they would cost about I think on the order of a thousand dollars. And there were videos of people jumping as high as a you know as a minivan. And uh, we thought, okay, we we have to do an experiment with these. Um, we bought some cheap knockoff versions of those. We weren't willing to invest the full price. Um, and all I can report is on the knockoffs, we had uh, our summer students practicing uh, several times a week for an entire summer to try to get good at running on these so that we could do an experiment. And uh, we were never convinced that uh, people could comfortably run on, on them. Um, so. So that's the experiment we dreamt of doing, and we eventually gave up on it. And then maybe there's something less extreme where you could alter the dynamics of running and, um, and make a prediction. But well, we have not figured out what that would be. Yeah. Wouldn't that be pretty easy with a bilateral amputee? Um, it would be easy for a bilateral amputee, but uh, you need a few things. First of all, you need bilateral amputee who runs, and then you have to get them a bunch of different prostheses, and you have to have access to these people. Uh, back in the time when we were in Michigan, uh, it was not that easy to, to find uh, act, you know, athletic, active bilateral amputees. Uh, it's, it's just a matter of uh, how big your, the city is that you live in. I would say Calgary, it's the same thing. Uh, you do you do have all of Alberta to draw from, but that's still not that easy if you wanted to say get 10, 10 of those people, it wouldn't be super easy. <clears throat> okay. Um, okay, I want to move on to, um, so remember I said we'll talk about costs and then I'm gonna complain about them. Okay, uh, first of all, let me just mention some lessons from optimal control. So the typical way that uh, you might uh, do this is you say, this is written in math language, but I'll try to say it in words. You have some function, say the duration and distance from the target you're trying to get to, and the higher the duration, the higher the distance, the worse. And what you're doing is you're trying to choose your decision variables, like you know your muscle forces over time, to minimize that. And these I would call, this is a performance measure. And a lesson in optimal control is if you only have a performance cost 
um, in what you're optimizing, the answer is usually pretty easy. The answer is you should go as hard as you can to reduce the dis duration of the distance. Um, which they call bang bang control it says you should go to the rails of you know how maximum muscle force or you know opposite muscle force uh, that's the sensible thing to do and so uh, as a result of that people generally know that they need two costs they need a performance cost what are you trying to do and if you're not achieving that um, that's bad. And then they need another cost, which they often call U squared cost, but basically some sort of a cost on effort because you need something to keep you from going to the extremes. Uh, and I should say, um, in some cases, you do want to go to the extremes, but those are very special cases. An example would be, um, you know, maximal height jumping. That's one where you don't care about how much energy cost you have and you just want to go as, as high as you can. Um, and so uh, extreme sports are examples of good, um, good tasks to study with a performance variable and that makes things easier. And so that, that's a helpful thing. But if you talk about normal life when you're not at the extremes, we believe that Effort costs matter. Okay, um, so you have a decision variable and an objective. What I showed you before was I showed you a bowl shape of energy cost only, and that bowl shape by itself was able to predict um, an optimum and a preference. However, we don't believe that that is um, the only thing that's happening in real life. Uh, and actually, an example I would give is uh, of why energy costs could not possibly be the only thing that you would minimize. First of all, all of you are not minimizing energy right now. If you really want to minimize energy, you should lie on the floor and you should die. And then you'll be returning energy to the environment. Okay, none of you are doing that. The other thing is if you need to get downstairs, it is not the most energetically minimal thing to, to take the stairs or even take the elevator. What's even easier is you should just jump out the window. Okay, so clearly there are other factors that we want to uh, consider. And when energy cost does show up as a, as a minimum and seem to predict things, I'm not dismissing that. That's what we've spent a lot of our time in the lab doing. But also we want to be cognizant that those are relatively specialized laboratory situations where we controlled for the other factors. But that, that, and I'm a fan of doing controlled experiments. It's just that we have to remember that in real life, other factors matter, and we don't want to propose a theory that is fundamentally incompatible with taking into account those other factors. Okay, so even though what I've showed you so far is energy cost only, there's no way that we believe that that actually is part of real life. We think energy matters in real life, but we think some sort of a performance cost matters as well. Okay, um, some things to say about it. First of all, if you have a performance term and an effort term, now this is kind of interesting because you have trade-offs between the two and just how we were able to trade off two energetic costs to vary human behavior, you could ex experimentally trade off performance and effort costs to um, to test human behavior. Okay. Uh, this is some slides complaining about minimum cost of transport, and I think I'm not going to go through this at length, but I'll just explain to you what the what the um, what the current issue is. Uh, metabolic cost of transport is defined as the energy divided by body weight times distance traveled. And it's a dimensionless quantity, and um, it's, a, it's a very helpful way to uh, take into account variations in body size, or even to compare one animal against another kind of animal. And the cost of transport curve for walking looks like this, and for running it looks like this. And then the observation is that 
um, you know, people prefer to walk if you just sort of take an average walking speed. It's typically pretty close to the minimum cost of transport. And it's become kind of standard to people for people to say, and uh, walking is to minimize the energetic cost of transport. Now, even though I'm a huge believer that energy matters, I am not a believer that energy, energetic cost of transport is the variable that you care about. And here's why. First of all, there's a cheat in this whole thing, which is that when people say cost of transport, what they subtracted out was a constant E0, which is typically taken to be, say, the basal uh, metabolic cost, or it could be, um, uh, it's not actually easy to do basal metabolic cost measurements. So an easier thing to do is just to do the cost of quiet standing. And it's only when you subtract that, that this minimum actually agrees with your, um, with what people seem to prefer. Uh, but also another, so, so that's a secret, um, it's a fudge factor that you get to play with uh, because there's nothing fundamental that says that you should take out basal metabolism or quiet standing or anything. Those are sensible sounding things, but they're not, um, they're not 100% defensible. However, if you were to fool people into agreeing with that subtraction, that's when you get this to agree. And if people didn't agree with you subtracting that, then this goes out the window. Okay, so that's one complaint about energetic cost of transport. Um, another is just that there's no such thing as people sticking to this speed because again, uh, you know, we're claiming that we think that there should be performance costs. What do you want to do should also influence um, how fast you walk. Um, an observation we've been threatening to do for a long time is uh, we've been saying, <clears throat> measure the wa walking speed on campus one minute before classes start, and then measure the walking speed on campus of people, say, 12 minutes after class starts. And then um, I'm going to claim that you're going to get quite different answers for walking speed. Okay, so um, I'm a big believer in energy, but I think in reality, you need to take into account what you're trying to do. What's the task? Uh, let me also do a, another complaint about cost of transport, which is that cost of transport, you could say, is um, the cost uh, divided by the reward. And it's essentially treating distance as the reward. Uh, so that, that's essentially saying the task is to walk a long distance. And I definitely agree that if you are migrating or foraging or just going on a long walk, it's quite arguable that your reward is the distance that you walked. But I also think that in normal human behavior, say especially when you're in this building, um, your reward for walking is not the distance you traveled, it's the destination. and. Um, what happens at that destination? Well, your behavior is going to be different, I believe, if um, at the, your destination we give you a pot of gold. Um, it's different if we give you a Snickers bar. Um, it's different if uh, you're making it on time to an appointment. Okay, so uh, inherent to this idea of cost of transport or implicit in it is the assumption that distance is the reward. And I'm just saying in modern daily life, distance is sometimes the reward, but usually not. Okay, uh, I'm going to skip this. Oh, actually, I, I won't skip one thing. There's a famous study, Bornstein and Bornstein in Nature, where they observe the walking speeds um, in different cities and villages around the world. And um, the, the paper is called The Pace of Life. And what they showed is that the preferred walking speed is slower in small villages and it's faster in big cities. And then uh, that observation seems to contradict the idea that people are choosing their walking speed to minimize cost of transport. Or at least we have no explanation why people in small villages would have a different shape to the curve that promotes a minimum th than in big cities. Okay.
Um, oh, this is a video. We'll just play. Okay, I probably need to click on something and there's no mouse here, but uh, Osman is doing experiments on fake uneven terrain and we're using optimization to uh, predict how people should cover that terrain. Okay. Oh, wow. We're, we're basically out of time and I covered the first part. Okay, so the second part is basically to talk about uh, reaching with the upper extremity and uh, it's basically, you could say, the same complaint as above except the opposite. So in reaching, people essentially are saying performance is the cost and effort doesn't matter. And then we think that's silly and we would argue that effort does matter even for reaching. And uh, part of it is a little bit of uh, thought experiments to argue why. And then Jeremy Wong has done the experiments uh, that we believe is um, in favor of why effort should matter in reaching. Okay, so I'm tempted to say we can skip this. And then uh, we can just talk about commonality. And in fact, even that we can skip a lot of stuff. So let, let's just jump ahead. Okay, so this is the commonality part. And this is again just favoring having trade-offs. Here's your objective function, the thing you're trying to minimize. Let's say that walking speed is the thing that is the decision variable. And um, we would think that there should be a cost that goes opposite to, um, to fast walking. An example is if you're in a hurry, it's a higher cost for you to go slow. If you need to pee, it can be an even higher cost for walking slowly. And then that should be contrary to some sort of an effort cost and then the trade-offs between your say performance or your task goal and your effort should help determine the overall behavior. Okay, we can, I think this will take five minutes. This is not um, a serious scientific study, uh, but these are some slides on uh, deciding on when you should pee and how fast you should walk to pee. Um, but you get out of here five minutes later if we cover this. Do you want to talk about this? Yeah. Okay. Let's imagine that your kidney is producing uh, urine at a steady rate. Your discomfort is then increasing over time. And then let's say there's a hard limit on that. So beyond the limit, bad things happen. Okay, what can you do? Well, you can go to the bathroom. So you can uh, build up to a certain level and then go to the bathroom, it goes down and then something like this. And then you're far from your limit and it seems like a great idea to go to the bathroom very often. Now, that's not what we do, right? We seem to go to the bathroom uh, fairly infrequently during the day. And why is that? Well, first of all, this is not the only thing that matters. There's also a walking cost. So it costs you energy to go walk to the bathroom. And um, that cost I've drawn as something, this is a cumulative cost that increases over time if you were to walk. And I put it here because that cumulative cost of walking, you could say, is both before you went to the bathroom and on the way back. And so I'm just accumulating a cost for walking over that time. And I'm saying that you peed in zero time, okay? There's another cost, which is um, what I call fear of missing something. Um, you were doing something, you were watching an important YouTube video, you were watching an exciting HPL seminar, who knows what, but for some reason, when you are busy going to the bathroom, you are not achieving that other thing. And so fear of missing something is another cumulative cost. Longer you're away, the more you miss, okay? 
these two costs are not in terms of discomfort, but in the end, you could say we have to make a decision of some sort. So why don't we just convert that into a discomfort? And then we have to add up those two things. So what you're seeing is a shaded area because these are cumulative costs and they're the summed cumulative costs of these two things spread both before and after going to the bathroom. And the problem with going to the bathroom often is that you are walking more and you're missing more. And so that is why you should not go to the bathroom all that often. Instead, you might anticipate when you're going to exceed the limit. And then when you're near that limit, you start walking, you pay your missing something cost and your walking cost, and then you get down, okay? So, so that's how you should figure out when to go to the bathroom. Oh, uh, I'm sorry about this. I actually did not finish this slide before 3 p.m., but I'll tell you where I was headed. You could imagine that over the course of, say, an HPL seminar, your, your attention fluctuates. The excitement level is going up and down. Or maybe it was just low the whole entire time. But um, that's what this uh, sort of lighter curve is indicating. But the idea is that you have to make another decision, which is sometimes the fear of missing something cost is very high because you are very excited. So what should you do? You should look for a lull in the action. So let's say you're watching a movie and you know that there's some climactic thing happening and then maybe there's going to be a lull for a minute afterwards. Of course, you would choose, if you can, to hold it until the lull happens, which is really hard to judge because you don't really know what's happening in the movie exactly. But I think that I think that's what goes through our heads of, can I hold it until I you know, I can bear to miss something, okay? So what I mean is that there's a sharper fear of missing something in some circumstances. If it's fluctuating, then you're cho choosing the time when this is least steep. But also what I mean is that you can walk faster, right? So if you to take, were to take the original walking speed cost, if you walk faster, there's a higher accumulating cost for that but the good news is that you walk for long, for shorter period of time. And so as a result, you might choose to walk faster and hurry so that you miss less. And then the cumulative cost from that tells you and your fluctuating interest level, these two things all go together to determine basically when to pee and how fast to get there. Okay. Um, so what, what we're proposing is that for both locomotion and for reaching, uh, I think there's been a lot of progress. I don't mean to make fun of all the people who've made progress in either category, except to say that the progress has been so great that really the next problem is not energy alone for walking and it's not performance alone for reaching. Uh, we can start to think about the other costs that we uh, that play a role in actual human behavior, and then that will actually improve the compatibility between the two. Okay, um, that's the end, but I'm just going to uh, pose a couple questions for you, um, which you can think about at your leisure or we can discuss, which is, uh, Curious human behavior is holding open doors for other people. And I will say um, that energetically, it's not the best thing to do. And then it's an indicator of another, say performance or task objective that is secretly inside those of us who hold open doors for others. Uh, but you, we could think of how to use optimization to, to uh, ask that question. Okay, let me... Uh, Actually, I'm not going to talk about. Oh, actually, another question is, why uh, why do people do this? You know, oh, I just want a point. <laughs> um, that's a waste of energy. Okay. Anyways, just want to acknowledge uh, the lab people who contribute to a lot of the stuff that is either um, were results here or uh, mostly it's actually results that are sort of coming in as we speak. And uh, I want to thank 
Ben Onig for the research chair, uh, which made all of this possible. Okay, thank you. similar to the the walking speed in different size cities that it's maybe a peer pressure uh, cost kind of that people feel they should hold doors open for people and then the same thing in like group dynamics that there's some peer pressure to, to walk at the same speed as everyone else is that the case or is that no are they well it's certainly a cultural thing and in that sense it there has to be a component of peer pressure to it. Not all cultures open doors uh, for each other. And so, at least in North America, which I'm most familiar with, yes, I agree, peer pressure is part of it, but peer pressure is not the only thing, I believe. And I guess an example is um, many, many more people hold open doors for others than give money to others. And so, there should be, or there could be, a similar peer pressure when somebody says, hey, can you give me a dollar? Um, he's not doing anything. What's wrong with him? Um, so I exerted peer pressure. did not, nothing happened. In the case of opening doors, people open doors, hold open doors for you, even when you didn't ask for it. But and uh, Couldn't that be said that the cost of giving someone money is greater than the cost of opening doors for another person though so then it's just you're, you're still trying to minimize the cost that that it's going to that you that you incur for holding a door open or giving a dollar to someone it just happens that holding the door open is less costly to you personally than giving money away well we didn't say how much money right so how much is holding a door worth 0.1 cents 0.0001 cents so Everything Depends is convertible. On your salary, I guess. Yeah. yeah. But <laughs> everything is convertible, right? So, you know, if I ask you to open the door and you refuse, there is an amount I can offer you where you will be willing. <laughs> First of all, I would like to challenge your idea about energy minimization. The child doesn't use that. So, if we would do that at that, we would have to learn that somewhere. And I don't see where we learn that. And the second thing is you've complained a lot about what is wrong. Did you show a solution? I, I, I didn't feel that. Well, you um, I, I, here's what I did show. I showed some evidence in favor of the optimal energetic costs uh, coinciding with a preference and for people electing that preference on their own without being uh, guided. And then if you talk about the bigger question of energetic costs plus other things, then I did not show a proof of that. I more proposed some thought experiments for why it seems to make sense. But I guess another uh, way of saying this is that um, you know, you make decisions all the time. You need to get to the top of that hill, and there are different paths you could take. And then, uh, and people might have worn some paths into place. And then, I guess the observation I would make is that the agreement is actually not too bad. Or another thing is, let's take people out of the, out of the equation, is there are deer paths, paths in the forest that were taken by deer, where they kind of agreed on where to go. And so um, I do think that um, energetic costs should matter. Uh, many of us uh, will prefer to take the elevator over the stairs unless we make a cognitive decision that, oh, it is better for me or I'm a more worthy person if I get the exercise from taking the stairs. Um, but also there's, there's a lot of behavioral evidence. So in shopping malls, um, you know, the reason why they put in the, all those escalators and the reason why the rent on the second floor of the shopping mall is much less than the rent on the first floor has to do with many factors, including the cost of getting up the stairs. And then, you know, th there's escalators are worth what they cost because of the various things they, they buy you. And then also, um, at least for me, I truly believe that laziness is an inherent and important trait 
in all animals. And of course, we fight laziness all the time. Playing as a child is an example of fighting laziness. And I, I guess if you want my hand waving explanation of playing, it's that nature uh, wants us to be able to move efficiently when we need to. However, it's not obvious how to do that. You can't pre-program that because the body is changing all the time. It's growing, it's developing. And also, uh, it's not necessarily something that you can even pre-program. So learning to move economically it could be nature's hack. Nature says, I want you, at least in adulthood, to be able to escape from the saber-toothed tiger. That is worth so much that I am going to build in a hack, which is basically I invented this thing called fun. And if you do this, you're going to waste some energy right now. But the good news is you will learn more about moving economically. And so it, the overall cost, you could factor in survival, plus how much food you uh, had to consume, how much time you had to put into playing, what tasks you were able to do later. You could say that the overall cost is such that it favors wasting some energy now for a overall gain later. So your solution is take other factors into account. Well, remember, I said there is no way I treat energy costs as the only cost of walking or reaching or anything. But I think energy is an important factor in all animals. And then our interest these days is in these other factors, such as I need to pee, I'm missing something in this exciting seminar that I'm going to, all sorts of other things. And even if our interest, our primary interest in the lab is energy, we want to for, uh, formulate our hypothesis in a way that's compatible with these other things, like playing or like intentionally taking the stairs when I could have taken the elevator. So I'm not necessarily able to explain when you took the elevator versus the stairs. That's a very complicated question. But I do believe that even if my interest is energy, I need to be at least cognizant of these other things mattering. Um, so from the point of view of our legs, it makes sense to study Energetics of walking and running right? it makes sense to study locomotion. But I've never understood why people study reaching. And um, of all the things we do with our arms, what are the right behaviors to actually study? What 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 should we be focusing on? Is reaching the right thing to to study? Uh, if if you ask me, I say reaching is a convenient thing to study. And I, that's one of my complaints about reaching is that it's abstracted from the, from the real task. The reason why reaching became, so for those of you not involved in neuroscience, uh, in neuromotor control, reaching is sort of the, the top thing to study. Um, it gets the most science and nature papers. Uh, it gets the most citations. And um, that's a social cultural phenomenon. And why does something become popular in science or in fashion? Lots and lots of things. But part of what drove reaching to become so important um, in the community was, first of all, people were doing uh, recordings of, uh, of neurons within the brain. And then they were able to correlate behavior in the motor cortex, say, with the direction of reaching movements. And so. Now we're talking real neurons and real neuroscience. And at the same time, the more theoretical people could use optimization and they could say, well, this is actually the optimal thing to do. And, um, and there's a, it's a very clean paradigm where uh, the typical thing is you have a little manipulandum that you interact with and it's possible to program the manipulandum to change the dynamics. So it's a great experimental paradigm. It's just that, um, Reaching is not the end goal. So often when you reach, you could say that you're reaching, say, to grasp or to push a button or to, to move something. And um, we would argue that part of um, the success of reaching as a field has become a little bit of a narrow 
uh, view of the world. Because that paradigm is so powerful, people are disinclined to study bigger problems of reaching and then grasping because you can't do as clean of an experiment when you include that. And I would say, yes, you can't do as clean of an experiment, but uh, that doesn't mean it's a bad experiment. I would argue against the two sides that are being taken. One is a very dynamical system, and one is a kinematic constraint system. I mean, your paper with Steve showed that if you have your arms in a constraint, you're actually less metabolically dominant than when you're moving your arms, right? And so that's a still a dynamic system. So in that case, you're dynamically optimizing your own energy and dynamic system. But I don't know that an experiment has been done in the opposite way, looking at how maybe your feet are stepping in a certain way with more motor control, immunization of jerk or something. Or is there? Uh, you mean people uh, using a kinematic objective for, uh, and not a, um, an energetic one? Yes. Well, um, I would agree people haven't done that much, but um, I would say that uh, part of the reason I, said, I think it would be less successful. I don't have anything to back that up. Well, one thing I have the backup is now there's actually quite a large body of literature about energetics of walking, and there's so many behaviors that are predicted well by energetics that it would be difficult to come up with a purely kinematic explanation for the body of literature. At the same time, let me just remind you that I'm talking about relatively focused laboratory experiments that are not about humans behaving in the world. And the question of when and how to go to the bathroom is an example of an, something that's not determined by energetics alone, right? So I am favoring other factors, including kinematics. I also believe that reaching and locomotion in a very broad sense are the same thing because um, what am I doing right now? Am I reaching or am I walking? Uh, at least at the highest level of executive function, the human does not differentiate between the two. In fact, uh, you know, a common phone conversation is, uh, where are you? I'm at the intersection of such and such and such and such. Let me come pick you up. Okay? So the fact that you're in a car has been abstracted out of the question of where you are and what you're going to do. And then the vocabulary, let me pick you up, is as if the, um, you know, the, the concept that's in your head is not that different from, from this concept. And so, yes, absolutely, kinematic things matter in walking because, hey, I'm usually walking to get to something to do some task. And so for sure that matters. And then in the laboratory experiment, the problem is that we took that away. We took away the decision. We said, please walk to that target. But that's also why I'm interested in the question of peeing, because that is the broader decision of whether you're gonna do something at all and, and when. Also, uh, you know, your question, I have a more annoying way that I ask the question or at least I make fun of other people. If I'm an experiment, if I'm a subject in somebody else's locomotion experiment in the lab, and if they sell, tell me, walk at my preferred speed, I say, I already am, it's zero. Because if I don't have a reason other than making the exper experiments are happy, my default state is often, more often than not, it's walking or sitting or sleeping or lying down. And so what's really driving my, quote, preferred walking speed in a laboratory experiment is I have decoded what the experimenter secretly wishes and I'm making a guess, oh, I think they want me to walk as if I were, you know, migrating to the next county or something like that. So 
Uh, absolutely, I agree. Kinematics matter. We'll take one last question from Brett. I think that's um, we can go long. Oh, sure. Um, can you go to your cost of transport slide where you have cost of transport for walking and running? And you show that, and immediately I thought, oh, he's going to talk about why people don't actually switch from a walk to a run where those two curves cross, and, and that's why cost of transport is a bad measure. That's kind of why I thought you were going to talk about. <coughs> Oh, okay. So you have a question about what I didn't talk about. Right. So, well, because I'm genuinely curious. So people want to switch from a walk to a run at around two meters per second, which is way before that cost of transport curve. If that was what you were trying to minimize, says uh, you should do, right? If, if it was that, that was important, you probably switch around two and a half or 2.4 meters per second. You don't. So. So what is the other, what's driving why people, in addition to the energy to, uh, requirements of locomotion, what's driving people to switch from a walk to a run? If I answer with a negative opinion of walk-run transition, am I insulting anyone in the room? No. OK. <laughs> I uh, really dislike the question of the walk-run transition speed. Wait, you're deflecting the question. I feel like you're going to go. No, right I, th I think I'm answering it. Okay. <laughs> uh, the typical question of walk run transition speed is there's hysteresis. If, if you have people walk on a treadmill and you gradually ramp up the speed, they may change to a run at a different speed as if you were going in the opposite direction. Yeah. It's a con completely contrived experiment. Uh, in reality, what you do is, how much of a hurry am I in? And then what, how am I going to solve that problem? Uh, Manoj Srinivasan wrote what I think is a great, great paper uh, explaining the walk-run transition, except it's not a walk-run transition anymore. What uh, Manoj showed, first of all, he doesn't use cost of transport. He explains this in terms of metabolic power, which I also believe is a more straightforward to explain it. But in terms of power, instead of cost of transport, you have a curve that starts off flat and then goes up. And then you have one for running, which, um, which also starts off flat and goes up. And then you're not choosing, or actually, um, I, I think I'm wrong about how this shape goes. But anyways, what Manoj says is that if you want to minimize the overall cost of your task, which is what we want to do, um, then you do not walk, 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 and then switch, and then run, 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 nor do you do any hysteresis thing. What you should actually sensibly do is you should do a mixture of walking and running. And then if you're at this speed, which is slightly uncomfortable for walking, you should walk a lot, but then sprinkle in a little bit of running at, at a speed that you prefer for running, and vice versa. And so the speed of the walk and the speed of the run are indeed somewhat close to the minimum that you see here, but not necessarily. Depends on the, what the task goal is. And the mixture of walking and running should be what, how you negotiate those two things. And by the way, that is how, so um, you know, birds and fish have a variety of gates and they switch between them and then you, you know, why do um, certain birds do flap, 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 uh, glide, flap, 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 glide? So that is also long ago was explained in terms of that's the optimal thing to do. It, it doesn't make sense for you to flap at a very uneconomical frequency. Uh, you should just solve the problem. And so what Manoj did is he took that same idea of flap and glide and applied it to walk run. He said, that's not the right question. Nobody does walk run transition. Um, in fact, there are, um, there, here's some examples of it. Um, first, first of all, ultra marathoners, they don't, they don't do walk run transition. They do a combination of walking and running and the mixture of that varies with the distance they're going. There are these races 
uh, in, that they used to hold in the West. I think they're less common now, but they're called ride and tie. One horse, two runners. What should you do? Well, one person should ride ahead and then tie the horse at some point, and then the next person is going to eventually catch up and get on that horse and ride, and they, they take turns. The mixture of, or you know, the question of how far you should ride before you tie, and then how far should you run, and that mixture, uh, people have argued, is pretty well explained through optimization. And so lots and lots of examples of don't do the thing in the middle, or don't switch in the middle. You should choose what's sensible based on these two different tasks and mix them as appropriate. But you say that you should walk until you feel uncomfortable, and then you should start <coughs> running. And if, if, I'm, if you're going off energy expenditure, then that uncomfortableness cannot be energy expenditure or rate of perceived exertion. Well, I guess it could be RP. But it's something else because you're 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 still going to start running. No, but I, I'm less saying economical to do so. No, no. Okay, so I'm saying that first of all, it does make sense that you should be not too far from these minima, especially the longer the task, the longer the distance we're making you go, the closer these ranges matter. And what I'm saying is, what you should do is you should walk near here for say 90% of the time and then do 10% of this 90, 10, and then that will get you uh, the optimal combination of walking and running that will actually be lower than this line for a certain speed. So whatever your task is that determines some sort of average speed you have to achieve, it's a combination of walking and running, different amounts of something in this range and something in this range, that's the optimal thing to do and that's much closer to what you observe among ultra marathoners than, than an idea that an ultra marathoner would be, let's say that the task is so that they were right here, you would not see them bubbling around between these two things or anywhere close to it. And so they only run because they're in a marathon and then they're racing against the clock, right? Uh, Otherwise you wouldn't run at all. No, sometimes you're in a hurry. Yeah. Okay. But I, but I would say, you know, in regular life, unless we're in a hurry, um, or unless we need, yeah, or we're in a race, we don't run all that much, provided we take into account nature built in this thing called fun, and sometimes it's fun to run briefly, but it's not that much fun. So if we need to move at a speed that's around 2.5 meters per second, are humans more likely to be efficient and walk and run, walk and run, or would they be speed walking, which isn't as efficient because they're higher up on the curve? Ah, okay. So the answer is absolutely. Okay. Well, let me just answer the question this way. So you can do a combination of this and a combination of this, and. Um, uh, basically, that combination of these two things can vary between zero and 100%, right? And so when I say a mix, I mean usually not 0% running or 100% running, usually something else. But the idea is that this whole knob that you can earn between zero and 100 includes zero and 100. And uh, I'm just saying that that knob has a setting that's going to be that's always lower than just running or walking at whatever speed that you see on this curve. But yes, a combination in general is faster than when you whenever you have curves like this, um, the optimum is in general, a combination which is cheaper than just choosing any point on these curves. Are humans more likely to choose the more efficient approach is like of having a combination? Okay, um, the stuff I said about ultra marathoners, I have to let me just admit that that is an that is an anecdotal observation. People have not actually done the study of uh, 
you know, actually taking data on ultra marathoners and what combination they actually did. So I cannot say definitively yes. However, I will say that has long been observed that ultra marathoners do a combination of walking and running. And when they run, they're actually running at, a, you know, a, a pretty, you know, people haven't taken the data on it, but if you watch the videos and things, you would say, hey, every time I see this person run, they, I would call that about the same speed. So um, at least from a qualitative or subjective point of view, I would say, yes, that is what people do. And then um, there was an optimization paper done on um, this ride and tie question. Um, and then, you know, how much time should you spend t riding? How much should you spend uh, running? Um, and then at least in that one, they had a little bit of data and then they argued that it explains things pretty well. But, um, you know, what I'm saying that people should do some combination of walking and running, um, we still need to know what people actually do and take data on that. But also, a kind of a mystery is how would people figure this out? People don't study optimization theory when they're hurry. You see them walking and you see them running. How do they know how to do that? And, um, you know, or do they even do that? I can't say for sure, but my observation is I think people are actually pretty good at gauging <coughs> energy expenditure in some sense. Or another way to say it is um, sometimes you see a tree canopy and you see these squirrels running around. And um, a squirrel has to make a critical decision when am I going to jump from this branch onto the branch of the next tree? And if the decision is made too late, the tree, the branch droops and they can't jump off of it. It's too floppy at that point. And then if they make the decision too early, they have jumped farther, perhaps farther than they're able to jump. So the squirrel's making a very complex decision. It's, it has to decide, am I going to be able to land this jump? How, how firm is that other branch I'm going to land on? Um, really difficult question, but they seem to figure it out. And then I certainly don't have any better ideas for them. Say, I can't think of a kinematic explanation for how squirrels do this. So yes, I think that even animals that we don't consider to be all that intelligent <clears throat> seem to be pretty good at anticipating or predicting or assessing their energetic and dynamic situation um, because there's an advantage to doing so. Mind if I answer anecdotally yep. on that one? So Brent and Lindsay both know that I walk really slow and they all have seen that very often when I try to keep up with them, I walk and then I run and then I walk and then I run. So at least one person <laughs> here adopts that. And I didn't know anything about this, by the way. So I'm at least one person who does that strategy. The dogs will do it too if you're walking at a speed that's uncomfortable. <laughs> Actually, um, <laughs> well, uh, another observation um, I can't remember. So the, it has been observed that uh, children trying to keep up with adults will do a combination of walking and running. And that's only if they are permitted to have some variation, right? So if you take a child's hand and you set the walking speed for you, then they will do whatever they have to because they don't have a choice. But if you give them a little bit of leeway to be faster or slower than you, then the observation is that they do a combination of walking and running. But my question is, <laughs> why don't they just choose to do one of those? It's because not cost of transport. So what is the uh, performance objective? It's not a performance objective. We could be migrating and we're in a hurry. OK, so then um, it's, it's really the reward is the distance. The point is just that if you walk, or run at two meters per second, it's extremely costly. And the other way to achieve an average of two meters per second is to do walking for a certain amount of time here and running for a certain amount of time here. 
And that combination can still get you an average of two meters per second. And that is more economical than, than doing anything on these lines. So I don't even like the question of walk-run transition. So, so, so but, then... But young parents with children that don't behave well should walk around two meters per section. <laughs> you tire the children. Um, <laughs> they get fast and tired and then, then they have more control. Okay, I don't <laughs> quite agree with control. you. So first of all, if you, want, if you want to make someone miserable, you need to know their curves, not your curves. Right? So you would want for the child their maximum misery. And then your curve is going to be somewhat different. And you're, maybe your misery matters, or maybe it doesn't. But uh, if your misery doesn't matter, then it's completely dictated by taking the child's hand and putting them right here. If your misery matters, then you, you can choose something somewhat different to take that into account. All right. Well, on that note, I think we'll end it here for today. Um, if you guys have any more questions, Mark is always here. So, all right, thank you. Um...